Hello and welcome to this video on behaviour change. We're going to take a slight detour away from the education evidence base and think about evidence from the wider realm. So why are we talking about behaviour change? Well, any change or innovation in schools requires us to change our behaviour, whether we are introducing a new homework policy, applying new pedagogical techniques in the classroom or adopting a new curriculum. It's all about change. Let's consider this Vivian Robinson quote. And draw your attention to this central assertion that the hardest part of change is its implementation. And that's why we really need to think about behaviour change and change in general. It's hard to change the smallest of habits, never mind an array of concurrent changes. The importance of hand hygiene and hand washing in hospitals is a useful analogy for the complexity of change, in that nearly 200 years after the evidence emerged of its efficacy and until the COVID pandemic, it remained a hard behaviour to change. The notion that millions of lives have been saved in the last century from hand washing is a fair estimate. However, the tales of victory actually hide the reality that something even as seemingly simple and established in public health still isn't or wasn't implemented consistently in hospitals. The evidence cited here, Wilson et al. 2011, shows that simply training has not sustained compliance in hospitals. Additional approaches were required to nudge and sustain behaviour change. Effectively, changing one small habit of a lifetime or a career requires more support than we often assume. American academics Chip and Dan Heath are the authors of Switch, How to Change When Change is Hard. We're going to hear their main thesis in this short video. When we want people to change, a lot of times we try to teach them something. We feel like, well, if dad just understood the health complications that are caused by obesity, well, surely he would change his eating habits. Or if my teenage daughter just understood how dangerous it is to text while she's driving, surely she'd cut it out. The problem, though, is that knowledge rarely leads to change. I mean, for instance, take the warning labels on most cigarette packs. Here's one. A cigarettes release carbon monoxide. I mean, do we think that the problem is that smokers simply don't know that cigarettes are bad for them? This isn't a knowledge problem. And the same is true for lots of other behaviors. I mean, right now, there are thousands of parents across the country trying to get their kids to understand why a tattoo may be a bad idea. The problem is when knowledge competes with coolness, you know who's going to win that one. Same goes for organizational change. When we want our employees to move in a new direction, our first instinct is to educate them. We want to bring them all together and step through a 72-slide PowerPoint presentation. John Cotter, the organizational change guru from Harvard, says that most people have a mental model that change happens in three stages. We present careful analysis, and that causes people to change their thinking, which leads to behavior change. But he says in his experience, that's almost never the way it happens, that in his experience, it happens in a different three-stage process. People see something that makes them feel something. It gives them the fuel to change. So if you want people to change, you've got to put feeling first. Let's go back to the cigarette packs for a sec, because there are other countries that actually do a much better job at connecting with emotion. So here's a pack in Italy, for instance. The translation of that is smoking kills. In Canada, they even push it a step further. They put photos on their packs like this one. Ugh. I mean, you may want that cigarette, but you catch a glimpse of those teeth and it gives you a second thought. What about this one? I think this is genius. You know, which one do we think is going to be better for the 17-year-old male psyche? The knowledge that cigarette smoking releases carbon monoxide or that this could happen to you? If you want your colleagues at work to change, You've got to start thinking about what you can get them to feel. You know, can you bring them face to face with customers who are underserved and have them feel some empathy? Can you confront them with some of your competitors products that are actually better than yours? Get a little competitive spark going. 
But whatever you do, just don't think that your job is done after you've shared some knowledge. Change comes from feeling. For more on feeling as a driver of change, come pay us a visit at fastcompany.com slash Heath. So the key message from the video is that we need to find the emotion to put feeling first when we're trying to foster change in others and obtain buy-in for our initiatives. Later on in the book, the authors use the analogy of the elephant and the rider. The rider is our conscious, rational brain. The rider plans, analyzes and solves problems. The rider needs clear instruction and direction. They need to know where they're headed. To apply the analogy to schools, our teams need to know exactly what it is that we're asking them to do. But the rider alone cannot complete the journey. The elephant is our emotional instinctive side. This provides the fuel for the journey. The rider can try to lead the elephant, but crucially, the elephant is simply more powerful. The rider will struggle to shift the elephant unless the elephant really wants to shift. To enact change successfully, we therefore need to appeal to the emotions of our staff to find the feeling. The third message here is about shaping the path and making it easy for our staff to enact change or hard for them not to. That might be by providing resources or discussing any new intervention within existing meeting times rather than adding new meetings into already over full schedules. A way of engaging with teachers' emotions is to ensure that we have clearly articulated how the change aligns with the school priorities and how that in turn will improve pupils' experiences. This is the why for most teachers, making things better for children and young people, especially those suffering from disadvantage in its many guises. And here's a modelled example, and here I'm exemplifying mechanism eight of the Professional Development Guidance Report, modelling the technique. I'm going to read it aloud. Our school values talk about excellence and equality of opportunity. However, we know that the achievement of our pupils with SEND is significantly below the national average. At the moment, for a whole host of reasons, we simply aren't doing a good enough job for those pupils. Some of those reasons are beyond our control, but there are some things that are within our power to change. We're going to focus on those to ensure we are giving all of our pupils the very best opportunity to succeed. Now, I've chosen this example because it works for a whole range of staff in our schools. This might be used in CPD with teachers about inclusive learning strategies, with teaching assistants about effective use of scaffolds with SENCOs and pastoral teams about acceptable adaptations to behaviour policies, and with office staff about improving systems for referrals and record keeping and managing communications with parents. So in this example, we set out very clearly the why. We link it closely to our values, our mission, what we want our pupils to have and to have achieved by the time they leave us. And we're making a real appeal here to our actions and the impact of those actions on our pupils. We're not blaming. We know that some of those reasons are beyond our control, but it's a real call to action to focus on those things that are within our power to change. Now, of course, a scripting like this may sound a little robotic and you won't want to deliver it as a script to your staff. However, the very process of scripting and articulating it makes it really clear in our own minds what it is we're wanting to say. What is our clear and compelling vision for doing this work and doing this work now? So I'd like you to pause the video here and have a go at scripting your call to action for a change that you're planning to make. Welcome back. I hope you found that useful. We're now going to move on to consider some models of behaviour change with the proviso that all models are wrong, but some are useful. And the first model we're going to look at is the COMB model, which shows how capability, opportunity and motivation combine to influence behaviour change. Starting with capability, these factors are typically about the individual, their skills, their knowledge and experience. This is where we need to think really carefully about the training needed to drive our ch change. Are we effectively building knowledge? Are we instructing teachers in new teaching techniques? Do teachers fully understand the problem that we've articulated? And what knowledge might they need to put it in action? 
Then the O is the, the opportunity. And this is typically about the organisation. How much opportunity do people have to familiarise themselves with the change? Is the CBD enough for them? Do they need ongoing coaching? What is the time that we are allocating for this change? How much opportunity do teachers have to practice the change? Are we going to build in peer observations, weekly reflections, follow on CPD? What are those organisational supports that need to be in place? And then thirdly, motivation. And here's where we see those clear links with those ideas from earlier. And the need to align with teacher beliefs about who they are and who they aspire to be as educators. How motivated is the person to make the change? How wedded are they to the existing practice? Is that change aligned with their beliefs? We're going to do um, another task now, thinking about a scenario. So let's say our scenario is that you've decided to focus on improving the use of scaffolding for pupils with SEND. We know that this is one of our key five a days uh, for good practice for supporting pupils with additional needs. And an active ingredient of your approach is that key vocabulary will be explicitly taught at the start of each lesson. So using the COM-B framework, what do you need to consider in terms of capability, opportunity and motivation to ensure that this innovation is successful, is achieved by all staff and all staff make those behaviour changes? So again, pause the video here, have a think about that and come back when you've done it. OK, welcome back. We're now going to move on to uh, a second model. And this allows us to dig a little bit deeper into that motivation part, that motivation aspect of the COM-B model. We're going to be thinking about the EAST model. And when, this was developed by the Behavioural Insights team, which was established by David Cameron when he was Prime Minister, to develop strategies for behaviour change or nudge theory. This is things like putting the fruit and veg by the door of the supermarket to get people to buy more and removing sweets from checkout tills or moving towards opt out pension schemes rather than opt in. Now, the East model suggests that to support people to change behaviour, we need to make that change easy to enact, an attractive proposition, a change that harnesses social norms and one that is timely in its communication. Now, this report is available along with all the other resources, and I'd particularly recommend that you read the executive summary on pages four to seven. Here's an example of how a small nudge can make a significant impact. When parents were sent test texts reminding them about forthcoming tests and homework, pupils' test results improved. And we can see there some of the trial data. So a large trial involving 16,000 students across 36 English secondary schools. Though, of course, we need to caveat this with the fact that the improvement was only seen in math. So we need to bring our criticality to these studies. But nonetheless, an interesting il illustration of those small nudges, those small behaviours that can have a really significant impact. Let's look at the E of East first, making it easy. So they talk about harnessing the power of defaults. We have a strong tendency to go with a default or the preset option since it's easy to do so. Making the option the default makes it more likely to be adopted. We can then reduce the hassle factor of taking up a new innovation. The effort required to perform a change often puts people off, but reducing that effort can increase uptake or response rates and simplifying our messages, making the message clear, often results in a significant increase in response rates to communications. In particular, it's useful to identify how complex goals can be broken down into simpler, easy actions. Let's take an example here, say, of the, an introduction of a teacher reading aloud programme. The hassle factor could be reduced by giving teachers a suggested reading list and by providing some of the books. And it might be that this is part of a wider strategy to improve reading fluency. And rather than giving teachers a range of ways to develop fluent reading, we might start by simply asking them to read aloud for 15 minutes, three times a week. 
Moving on to A, making the change attractive. For most teachers, as we've, as we've seen, improved pupil outcomes will be the main reward, particularly when we're talking about those vulnerable pupils. But if we can make it attractive as well, then we're maximising the chances of seeing that sustained change. For example, if we take our teacher reading aloud strategy, presenting our teachers with a collection of, for example, six beautiful new books for their read aloud sessions can maximise buy-in. Especially in, if, in this example, if they align with those teacher beliefs around, for example, the need for a more diverse curriculum. Moving on to S, making it social. It can be really helpful to show that most people perform the desired behaviour. Describing what most people do in a particular situation encourages others to do the same. Similarly, policymakers should be wary of inadvertently reinforcing a problematic behaviour by emphasising its high prevalence. For example, we might share a pilot of what happened in another class or success, share success stories from other schools. It can also help to use the power of networks. We're embedded in a network of social relationships and those we come into contact with shape our actions. So if we are piloting our innovation, we might want to do with that with someone who will champion the work, someone influential and positive in those networks. And we can also drive change through encouraging people to make a commitment to each other. We often use commitment device devices to voluntarily lock ourselves into doing something in advance and the social nature of these commitments is often crucial. Returning to our example here we might ask each year eight tutor to suggest a book to try uh, and commit to engaging with for our read aloud strategy. I'm thinking really carefully about the timing of our innovations prompting people when they're likely to be most receptive. The same offer made at different times can have drastically different levels of success. Behaviour is generally easier to change when habits are already disrupted, such as around major life events. This might be the start of a school year or, for example, in recent history, the return from lockdown. Consider the immediate costs and benefits. We're more influenced by costs and benefits that take effect immediately than those delivered later. So we should consider whether the immediate costs or benefits can be adjusted even slightly, given that they are so influential. For example, if we're asking our teachers to add something new into the timetable, what can we remove from that timetable to make space? And helping people to plan their response to events. Uh, can have a huge impact. We know that there is often a substantial gap between our intentions and our actual behaviour. A well evidenced solution is to prompt people to identify the barriers to action and to develop a specific plan to address them. OK, over to you. Um, you can download this pro forma from the resource deck, um, which is uh, your chance to have a look, to think about your innovation and to evaluate it against this East grid. Is it easy, attractive, social and timely? Pause the video here and we'll group, regroup afterwards. OK, welcome back. I hope that was useful. So in this last part of the session, we're going to think about some challenges to long term change. It is a truism to say that schools are busy, complex places which can throw up barriers to change. It's worth considering some of these so that we can plan our response. Now, you'll see here some challenges to long term sustained change in schools, and you no doubt will have others of your own. But thinking about teacher turnover, gaps in teacher knowledge, and this might be particularly true with the introduction of the early career framework in that our newer teachers will have uh, had rigorous training around the secure evidence base of good practice in classrooms but is there a gap where our teachers with perhaps three or four years of experience have missed out on that training insufficient teacher training or disrupted teacher training because of covid lockdowns unclear communications changing priorities and competing demands and competing teacher and leader beliefs let's think about what some 
possible mitigations we might be able to put in place for some of these. So thinking about our teacher turnover, we might feel that we've um, implemented change and successfully trained all of our staff. But if we have high teacher turnover, how do we retain that institutional knowledge? Well, really clear routines for induction, routines and processes, which make sure that all of that knowledge is retained within our systems. If we have gaps in teacher knowledge or insufficient teacher training, it's important to acknowledge those and to make sure that we plan any CPD to meet teachers at their starting points. Unclear communication, so does the rider know how to direct the elephant? Really important that we have clear uh, expectations and perhaps a communications plan so that those re um, expectations can be communicated over and over again so that there is no room for misunderstanding. And we know that schools um, have ever conflicting and competing priorities and demands. So really important that any innovation or change that we're making is really closely aligned with our school development plan so that we've got a real, uh, really strong rationale to return to. And if we have competing teacher and leader beliefs that link to the school development plan, really important, but also making sure that we are starting with the why and we're using evidence to support. And that's the evidence drawn from our own settings, from our careful identification of priorities, and also the evidence on which we've drawn to identify our solutions to those issues. So a couple of reflection questions to consider as we come to the end of the session. What specific behavioural changes are we expecting and what may inhibit them being developed? And how do the COMBI and or EAST models help us to identify or reconsider in our implementation plan as important support factors for success? Come to the end of the video now. Thank you very much.